Hello, welcome to Conversations, Music Within Inuit Culture and Language. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. My name is Alison Hardwick. I'm originally from the Nazivut and currently reside in Toronto, Ontario, where I work at the Inuit Art Foundation. Although we're all joining remotely across North America, very many time zones today, um, I would like to acknowledge the land I currently reside on. I am on the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississauga of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, the original owners and custodians of this land. Today, this place is home to many, including a diverse urban indigenous community of Inuit, First Nations, and Métis. Thanks again for joining us today. Conversations is a series of six live webinars across 2021, bringing together Canadian and Alaska Inuit for moderated discussions with audience participation, providing information and insight, insights on subjects important to Indigenous communities. This series is a partnership between Inuit Art Foundation and the Smithsonian Arctic Study Center. We want to thank our advisors, Sonia Keller Combs, Casey Peruk, Kumigu Hopson, Krista Zawatsky, and Takralik Partridge for their generous knowledge and guidance. Today's conversation will be moderated by Tiffany Ayalik with speakers James Domic Jr., Byron Nikolai, and Julia Ogina. Tiffany Ayalik is from Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories of Canada and is Inuit from the Kugluktuk region. She is a composer, performer, and educator in storytelling, singing, and movement, as well as a TV host, actor, and media producer. James Domic Jr. is an Inupiaq musician, audio producer, composer of film scores and soundtracks. His family comes from Katsubu. Did I pronounce that correctly, James? Mm. Awesome. <laughs> Area of Alaska. And Byron Nikolai is a Yupik singer, dancer, and musician born and raised in Toksuk Bay, Alaska. He began posting music videos on Facebook at 14, very cool, and performs across the Arctic and the US. Finally, Julia Ogina was born in Lokotok, I hope I said that correctly, apologies for my pronunciation, and is a longtime resident of Cambridge Bay in Nunavut, Canada. She is an educator who teaches Inuit language, music, song, stories, dance, and skin sewing. To find out more about each speaker and the moderator, please visit the event page on the Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center website. Uh, now I'm going to pass it off to Tiffany to begin the conversation. Thank you. Kwana so much, Allison, and big Kwana, Kwana Piaf, thank you to the Inuit Art Foundation and also the Smithsonian for collaborating in the, the production of these incredible conversations that I'm so, so honored to be a part of. Uh, hi, nice to see everybody. And uh, I am so thrilled to be here, just helping to move the conversation along. Um, I, I am Inuk from Kogloktok, as Allison said, um, but born and raised in Yellowknife. And something that I share in common with these amazing uh, speakers is a multidisciplinary approach, working in lots of different types of, of art, um, and always being trying to find ways to ground myself um, in, in Inuit culture, in Inuit Ayamayutakangit, and how to exist in a, in a landscape that was very different from our ancestors and how to move forward in a good way. So I'm just so honored to be included in this conversation. And uh, I would love to kick off the, uh, the conversation with uh, something that maybe not a lot of um, our audience will uh, have an appreciation for, but I think it's important to start with. And that's that uh, Inuit across the circumpolar, across the Arctic, are not one homogenous group. We are very distinct all across the Arctic and that we have different languages, we have different clothing styles, we have different cultural customs. And of course, there are many, many things that unite us and that are similar across um, uh, regions and dialects. But I'm wondering if I can um, talk to Julia first about that. Uh, you are from Uluhaktok and you live in Cambridge Bay now and you've traveled quite a lot across the Arctic and you are our, our dear, dear elder. And I would love to have a little bit more context that you've seen about our similarities and differences across region that you've come across. Some of the similarities uh, 
we we speak Inuktun right across, and it's dialects that makes us different. And um, studying history of our people and my understanding of who I am, um, I carry four dialects within me because I grew up uh, uh, around my grandparents who all came from different dialectal groups. So I speak the language, but um, I speak the dominant Inuit Nakdun of Kangaroo Mute because both my parents are Kangaroo Mute dialect um, dominant language. So it's looking at them differences before the communities were formed in our region, um, there was 21 dialectal groups. So 21 uh, groups make up the three communities. So again, when you start to study who you are and talking with the elders, that's what we learned, what I learned with some of the, the differences and how vast they are and how families made up those 21 dialects. Amazing. I didn't even know that. That's so cool. 21. Yeah. Just trying trying to struggle to learn one. I'll stick with the one for now. <laughs> yeah, that's how we begin. <laughs> yeah, one word at a time. I would love to chat with uh, our uh, cousins across an imaginary border known as the United States Canadian border. <laughs> you know, we were amazing roamers. We traveled all over the place, and it, uh, you know, we have cousins who straddle the border of across Canada and Alaska. And um, maybe I'll uh, jump over to James. Have you, um, you know? In, in terms of being from a from a more a Western Alaskan um, perspective, is there anything from an Alaskan context that you notice is different or similar compared to our NWT and Nunavut counterparts? Yeah, I noticed you know many similarities, um, uh, and I think there are more similarities than differences. Uh, but uh, we did roam quite a bit, and I know for a fact that I I I do have family that's buried in a gulik so mm -hmm. i know that you know over the over the yeah over the course of the winter time you i mean you're able to go really far on dog teams um but yeah the uh i've i have friends from greenland and every once in a while they they speak in their language and i can understand some of it just mm -hmm. like one or two or three words but it's crazy to me that across this big barren <laughs> you know landscape we you know we have we have so much in common and uh yeah it's uh it's uh yeah the border's only been there for a couple hundred years so yeah. totally yeah and byron you have an incredible and vast social media um network and a large large following and i'm assuming you have uh, Inuit from all across the circumpolar, from Alaska to Canada to Greenland, who have really resonated with your music. Um, through your fans, have you had any um, opportunity to have conversations with other Inuit about some of the, the things that you're portraying in your art? Yeah, so I, I traveled to uh, Greenland, I think it was in I believe 2014, 2015 for two weeks during the summer. And uh, initially I was there to um, teach dance and I noticed there was a lot of similarities. Um, me being a drummer and a dancer, um, the drums were a bit similar and I, I believe they still use um, skin for the head, which we used to do um, a while back. We used to use um, walrus stomach and while I was there teaching them, I noticed that um, they're pretty quick learners with the dances. And I think it's because they also have their own ways of dancing. And um, the similarities in between those is <clears throat> the storytelling, um, the storytelling, and also some of the, uh, the dialects that um, the, some of the words that they speak. And I noticed that um, with our relatives out in Canada and Greenland and up north here in Alaska, 
And um, that's just um, another way that we were able to connect. And humor is a big, humor is big within the Inuit, Inuit community. So that was something that I was able to see while I was out there. Absolutely. I think that's something that is so uniting across all Inuit territories and communities is, you know, the intense seasons, the harsh winter, the very difficult living conditions. And to people maybe outside the community, you would think that we would just be depressed all the time because life is so hard. But I think that the wisdom of our elders and our cultural teachings is to find the comedy, to find the lightness, to find the celebration in everything that we do. Otherwise, it makes living in the Arctic um, impossible without humor. And I've always loved that and enjoyed that, that no, no matter where one or two or three Inuit gather, there's always like tears of laughter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true. the best. It's the best. <laughs> And when women, when the Inuit women gather, you could definitely hear their laugh from miles away. So, hey, what are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Kwana. No, I have, um, I have aunties, and growing up in a small community, um, you're around family a lot, and the community is basically your family. So everywhere you go, you're gonna have your mom or your aunties just have a conversation, like um, almost like small talk, but it's not really small talk. It's you know, you're in a community and that's your family. So it's so always it's so always nice to nice to have a laugh. That's the universal across <laughs> the Arctic. Um, so thank you so much. And I'd love to talk a little bit about um um the the arc of the conversation that we want to have today if we're going to talk about um uh traditional music we're going to talk about language within um Inuit cultures and Inuit music um we're also going to be talking about this time in history where we're in an exciting um phase where lots of tradition and technology is blending and that we're in a very dynamic position where we're reimagining very ancient ways of, of singing and dancing and creating art. Um, and then we're also gonna talk a little bit about the importance of respectful engagement with elders, with knowledge keepers and how we keep these traditions alive, how we can revive uh, Inuit language and Inuit music in a way that's accessible and exciting for the next generation so that they care about it in the way that we do all here today. Enabled in, in order to you know keep keep the health of it going to keep it a vital part of Inuit communities, uh, and I'm I'm always thrilled to be having these conversations. So maybe I'll go to Julia next. Um, you do a lot of work um, interviewing elders, working with uh, knowledge keepers in uh, Kitsilmut communities in the Western Arctic in Canada, and um, you've been doing this work for a long, long time. You've created song books, you've documented lyrics, um, you've done prolific work on documenting and preserving uh, language through song. Can you talk a little bit about that work and why you think it's important and how you go about engaging with elders? Work began with uh, empowering, wanting to know, seeing the gaps, um, what I didn't know, uh, why I couldn't retain a whole song, why I couldn't sing a whole song in order for me to create new singers, because that's what I crave for is people to sing with. And with the energy that I saw amongst my grandparents and great grandparents and amongst the elders, their peers, I knew there was a lack of um, understanding of the songs. So we went about, a group of us went about um, creating questions based on what we knew and what we didn't know and what we wanted to know more of. And I've heard um, some of the elders say things like, oh, you wouldn't want to sing that song. And that always resonated with me. Um, when an, another peer wanted to sing a certain song, you wouldn't want to sing that song. And that stuck with me and I always wondered why. And I learned over time, colonization had an effect on 
even the elders that didn't go to school and um, how they shared what was safe for them and safe amongst who. Some of the songs that um, we started to learn to sing, we didn't know the, how to visualize. We could only sing the songs because we heard them, but we couldn't visualize the story. There were many of us in my generation and younger. And that was very important to me to showcase a song and its story and how, what people are visualizing. I've often seen singers of our songs shut their eyes and sing. And I always wondered, are they thinking? What are they seeing? And when they shut their eyes, they're visualizing the story as it's happening in their time, the time of that song when it was created. It's so different from where we're at today. So when I sing a song, I try to visualize it the same way. And as I'm teaching, I realize I'm not teaching to visualize the story as is. So one of the things I started to do was understand the terms and finding pictures, artwork that depicts some of the stories. So this is a story, a picture in the songbook that I worked on with a number of elders for two different dialectal groups, Inuit Nocturne and Nuttilling Mute. Um, we created, we chose 10 songs and songs that were still sung by elders in the community. Even though they were a few, we selected those 10 songs throughout. And we didn't create a CD even though people wanted an audio because we still had singers. And the, the vision of the book was take the book and go find those singers that knew the songs and learn with them. My fear was if we created a CD right off the bat that people would stay home and put it into their CD player and learn individually. Music, drum dance music, all music is sung with a group of people. And that's what I wanted to see back. And that's the hope that um, of our language, of our ancestors is to keep that thriving, to be able to see young people shut their eyes and visualize the song that they're singing so that they can better interpret, put the energy that they need, their vibrant voice into the song and rhythm so people can want to dance. I sing, you dance. Hey. <laughs> There's no better endorsement than that, Byron. <laughs> Byron or James, do either of you want to speak a bit about, um, from an Alaskan context, the, the storytelling inherent in the traditional forms and maybe how you use storytelling in your own work, um, whether that's traditional or not? No, I just want to go back to what Julia was saying about visualizing these stories. Now, with a lot of these traditional songs, um, you have to understand that they've been passed down years and years and years. And a lot of the older songs that you hear today, at one point, that is what they were doing within their timeline. And just to be able to hear um, hunting stories or kayaking stories, um, you, you, you could really visualize what the, what the singer or who the composer went through. Because even I, as a, um, as a drummer, I try to create my songs from the experiences that I've had. And when I'm listening to other songs and you could hear the passion in the voice and you could hear that, you could hear how the story was, um, how the experience was portrayed from how the song, how the song sounds, and from the dance movements, and how intense, how intense they're drumming, and for like one of the songs, um, we've got a blessing song. Um, 
I just recently learned about it um, a few years ago. Um, Darbaut Tomkin is a song um, that talks about uh, saging. Now, my uncle, he told me that back when our uh, people used to live in sod houses, they would take their kayaks, their hunting equipment, um, they would take their clothing and they would sage them, they would dagvak them, praying to Samyo, creator of the outside world, saying, if there is any catch out there, please make sure that um, the spirit um, of the animal is handed to me, not, um, mm. not by forcefully, but from the spirit alone. And so mm. just learning about that, it brought me back to um, I, I, I mean, I could visualize how it must have been for them. Um, I was having to live off the land and the, some of the songs that they create, uh, there's also humor. And so even during those times um, where missionaries were coming or, or during colonization, they would still find ways to enjoy themselves through dance and Okay. Um, I was always told that dancing was a way to bring everyone together, um, no matter the situation you're in, no matter you're a widowed or you're, um, you're adopted or you're still trying to figure out um, your identity. I mean, just being able to be a part of that um, event or that community gathering, it kind of brings like a sense of peace, like you're supposed to be there. Mm. So um that's kind of how I feel with, um, I know that's how I feel with traditional drumming and dancing. And with today, now that um, we're in 2021, the 21st century, um, a lot of the songs that I um, create, they're heavily influenced by what I, what I was told growing up in school. Uh, we had these elder talks. And what that is, is a couple elders would come into the school and the students would gather in a gym or in an area where everyone could take a seat. And the elders would talk about um, inachutitz and alachutitz, which means do's and don'ts of life. And hearing that, um, I understood um, what my mom has told me throughout the years, which is, which means I'm telling you this because I love you. Now, they were coming in every week for years and years. And when they're doing that, they're kind of um, planting these thoughts into your head. And so when I'm creating my music, um, a lot of the things, they just kind of flow out just because I've heard them so many times over the years. And so it's kind of, um, I could definitely see the transition in storytelling throughout the years. Amazing. It's so cool to think about being a part of a thousands of year old lineage and tradition and that we're playing our part in the preservation of, of these things that have been passed, 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 passed down. Um, and to know that we're not only the, um, you know, the expressors, we're not only here to, to perform that, but we're also here to um, you know, hold and, and protect and, and like, uh, you know, hold the, the space and the container for that and kind of looking, we're, we're caretakers, we're, we're keepers of something in order to pass it on. Mm -hmm. And this work is really important. James, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the, your experience with any of these stories through music and, um, you know, so I'm, I know a lot of these things have a super visual element and, you know, in your work in film and television, scoring music for film, that you're, you're working with someone else's visual element in order to support the music or to support the story. Can you talk a little bit about that? People like Julia are like personal heroes of mine because they take time to to try to preserve something, something that, you know, was tossed aside by, you know, when, 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 when the transition happened. And, you know, I see us as, I see myself as just another link in a chain, connecting the, the past and the future and just holding on to what I know and trying to pass, use what I know to try to pass it on to, you know, to, the, to inspire the next. Um, you know, uh, using, you know, you, uh, the, there, for some of the stories that I write and some of the stuff that I, you know, produce, 
it's you know set in Alaska, it's set up north. And so trying to invoke a mood or a vibe or a spirit, you know, there's only there's only you know one way I see in, and that was just through traditional uh voice, through traditional drums, and you know, and I I the I what I envision is what palette did our ancestors have? I want to use that. I want to see, okay, what did they have? They had their drums, multiple drums. They, they hit them from this side, from this side on the rim. They had their voices, men's, women's voices. They stomped their feet, maybe some shakers, maybe, you know, and so I wanted to use, I wanted to confine myself into what our ancestors worked with and then try to make something new with that. Uh, you know, uh, to me, the creativity is putting two things together that don't really go together, but you find the way in. Uh, and so nothing captures the spirit of the North like our music, because uh, our voices, our songs, traditional songs, traditional drumming. It it's, you know, the the arts were taken from us, our arts. And the reclamation of our arts, our singing, our dancing, our storytelling, in order to, I believe in order for us to reclaim those, we have to shake off the shackles of guilt and shame that were placed onto our sounds. And, you know, um, the work that Julie is doing, the work that Byron's doing, you know, it's inspiring to me. It's just, just to hear it, you know, just to see it and hear it, but yeah. Absolutely. It's so cool to think about, um, you know, not only the continuation of songs and stories, but to think about the continuation of Inuit values as they are um, expressed through ingenuity, creativity, mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at things from many angles. And uh, I think that that... Ooh. It's getting hot in here. Oh, it's something's cooking. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry everyone the zoom reality of uh working from home <laughs> and also eating and needing to feed oneself at home <laughs> <laughs> so i think about the um the the expression of uh, our our ancestors were so so brilliant in creating our our world views and helping us to understand what are our values of inuit culture and that they aren't only based in a specific time. You didn't have to only be traditional in, you know, pre-contact. You could be a practicing Inuk. You could be very rooted in Inuit culture based on our values any time throughout history. And that are the wisdom of thing having values as Inuit culture, like ingenuity, teamwork, you know, um, you know, respecting each other, providing for those who need support. All of those can happen if you're in the high Arctic, if you're living in a small community, it can happen if you lived 200 years ago, it can happen if you live in, you know, an urban center, it can happen anywhere. And I think that the, the brilliance of our ancestors to create systems of value that can really work in any situation life throws at us is one of the reasons I think that our cultures across the Arctic are so dynamic and so, um, you know, able to survive incredible hardship like colonization, like residential schools, like ongoing systematic racism and barriers. And I, I really, um, really am always being uh, reminded of, of that wisdom, that cultural wisdom in order to be you know, still connecting to my culture, even though I'm in Vancouver, <laughs> to find ways to keep finding ways in. Um, I would love to um, talk a little bit about um, there's many, many different types of songs. And maybe, Julia, you can talk a little bit about, you know, songs that were meant for, you know, very specific purposes, like settling arguments or songs that were meant to, you know, tease the singer, things that we sang about ourselves in order to, you know, poke fun at our own bad planning or to, you know, show that we have a sense of humor or songs that were specifically meant for children. So maybe can you talk a little bit about that from a Inuit perspective? I've never really connected to um, what you just described, but one of the ones that I've connected to and that stuck with me is healing, healing 
um, writing a song because the person wasn't well for many years and he was sent down to sanitarium, uh, TB sanitarium, and he had spent uh, nine years already in sanitarium with TB. And he started to think, you know, this is where I'm probably going to end up passing, living the rest of my life. And in his dream, an elder visited him and sang a song and spoke to him and told him, if you're going to get well, you need to create a song. If you want to get home, if you want to return home, you create a song. And she disappeared from her history. And he thought about it and he thought about it and he searched in him for a song and nothing came. He didn't know how to compose a song the way he heard them composed. And she came again to him in a dream, another dream, feeling his struggles and to create a song and advised him, think of your family you have that you've left. Think of the animals that you've hunted already that you've caught in your hunting life. And that's how he created his healing song. After he created his song and started to sing it, not long after he was told he can return home as well. And so that became his healing song and that song we continue to sing today. Amazing. You know, it settles, it settles his worry. It gives him power, our values, our system of how we stay connected to sharing our stories. So healing is part of an ongoing journey of our people. Kwana. Uh, James or Byron, do you have any um, very, as, as you were diving into your own research and, you know, own experience with different song types, have you come across any, you know, surprisingly specific uses for some songs that aren't just like, oh, this is background entertainment music? A lot of the times um, when I'm making a song, uh, usually what I would do is I would go online and look look for some instrumentals and if i if i feel like i can create something with it based on how i'm feeling at the moment then it's i i don't question myself i just go for it um if that's what i'm feeling then it must be what i'm supposed to be doing and a good example um would be a song called dangak sugamkin that i created it's called i want to see you um, it was made during the, the lockdown. And Dangak Sugamkin, I want to see you. You could kind of relate to it during these times because um, we've all had to stay indoors and we've, we've, we didn't get a, really get a chance to see the people that we usually see go out with friends. And originally, um, that song was, um, I made that song based off of how I was feeling um, with my relationship with my dad. And after, after, during that night that I created it, um, I l listened to it and, you know, it could be, it could be meaning, it could mean more than one thing. Um, it would, for me, it's, it's about my dad, but uh, for others that listen, it talks about wanting to see someone that you miss. And a, lo a lot of songs are gonna touch individuals differently. Um, I've noticed that back home, traditionally, uh, we've got uh, dancers or drummers who would go down to certain songs because the community understand that understands that this this is the person's song, whether it's for humor or for the intensity of how they dance, and um that that kind of I feel like that would give that individual um, a sense of um, knowing that 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 is their song um and i think when you put all of those together it creates this 
whole environment to where you 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 can always enjoy whether um you can always enjoy the song or the dance whether it's your song or not uh, just because you have someone to look forward to dancing it yeah you know i to speak on that um you peel back the layers of what our singing and dancing is and it's it, it's about expression it's about self-expression and when if you they took you know the powers that be took away our arts it in fact you know took away our ability to express pain joy happiness healing these are all things and i think our you know our people sang and danced all the time you know we see hunters coming back with a catch they you know they would be dancing on the beach and i can't you know i think about that and it, give, it gives me chills because that's how it used to be and nowadays in alaska anyway a lot of the dance is for show it's for entertainment it's for tourists mm. but the way it used to be and the way it still is in places that are still connected like point hope my family in point hope you know they still drum and sing to the ice to get it to move when they're wailing you know they still drum and sing to the wind to change directions you know so there are places in around that are still connected uh and it's important to find those places and bring that flame back up because that's those are the places that were the keepers and uh but it's about the expression and the, that's if you weren't able, if you aren't able to express yourself through anything, then you, the, the pressure that builds is too much. You got to let the pressure off and singing, drumming, dancing, creating. Those are the ways that we did it and why we have to find our way back. Mm, yeah, beautiful. Totally. I think that you know, as, as human beings with very complex experiences and feelings and emotions that, you know, part of some of the, the legacy, the harmful legacy of things like colonization that happened all across the Arctic is, you know, what you're saying, James, the, the, the stripping away of our ability to express ourselves as the fullest human extent of human experience will let us. And, and when we take away our dance, we're taking away our, our incredibly important connection to our body. When we take away the voice, when we take away our songs, we're taking away our ability to connect to the supernatural, to each other, to sing in community. You know, when we take away land, we're also taking away a huge part of the inspiration for our language, for our um, music. And, you know, as you chip, chip, chip away at those very powerful modes of expression, what we're left with is the dwindling and, you know, ever shrinking um, human that's left behind that's also, you know, more controllable and, um, you know, more, you know, not as strong and not as interconnected in the community. And I think that one of the most radical, badass things we can be doing as, as Inuit, as Indigenous people is you know, reclaiming those things that were taken from us to allow us to be the full extent all the way to the edges of who we are in body and spirit um, that I think is so beautiful to see in, in different ways how it's happening all across the Arctic. Julia, you talk a little bit in your work about <clears throat> the different styles of learning and that traditionally you know, you spoke about, you know, visualizing the song about the importance of, of oral learning. And, and now we're in a period where fluency might not be the same across the community and that we need other tools and we need other supports to help us, whether that's written, you know, because we're reading our languages now, whether that's physical depictions through other art, through printed art. Can you talk a little bit about, um, how this transfer of knowledge needs to encompass many different types of learners in order to be thriving. So true. Um, Inuit are very hands-on, visual, hands-on learners. I find majority of us are, and oral, 
a lot of our histories, oral and doing um, so expressive, so much expression. Being able to write the songs um, and understand the terms, translate, interpret the terms is another, not only writing, but having to interpret um, a term that's used in a song and used only in song. Um, drama, being able to act out a story, act out a term so that people are, um, our young people are grasping the story, visualizing, being able to sing um, is another goal, um, to be able to share the songs, not only within our, our, our floor when we have dance practice, but to take it home and to be able to be excited to sing. And this is what I know. This is where I want to play. I want to play dance. And I thought that was, you know, your effective. Like I questioned so many times, am I doing the right thing? Am I effective? And as I was questioning that at one time, I got a, um, a tag in a post on Facebook um, where a young lady said, my nephew and my niece, who are three, three and four at the time, were playing Bugalik and Julia, meaning my husband and I. I sing for you, you sing for me, and I dance. And this is what I want you to sing. And he was, he was expressing the story of the song because the young girl didn't know the song. She did, didn't come out to dance practice. So I saw him, what I saw him doing through that was he was teaching his little cousin who's turning three, the song that we share the stories when we're doing dance together drumming together. We have weekly um, dance. I don't like calling them practices because we're not practicing. We're singing, we're thriving, we're storytelling. And that's the energy I want our young people to take home and to see that happening in the homes of these songs, the stories being repeated because we're acting, we're retelling, we're sharing. It may be a hunting story like Byron said, today's way of hunting is so different than the way these stories were told. So again, when I say it's a hunting story or we're singing a hunting story, I always think of, okay, what are the young people seeing? Driving on a schedule, hunting with a rifle, hunting with a rifle. Today's kind of sled and today's way of hunting and coming back. Whereas when these songs were written, it was totally different transportation, totally different hunting tools, a different environment that they went home to. So retelling these stories to try and put visual to the way it was and using energy and checking in with the learners what did I just finish saying? How did I just express it? Can someone tell me? And I find having that dialogue with the dancers and the learners engaging with them all the time that they're taking it home. It's not just a dance practice. We're transferring knowledge. We're making people understand. And these little people are little teachers. They're the best teachers. If you could make them understand, they're the best teachers. Mm. It's so true. I feel like we're in this stage, um, you know, because of colonization, the, the traditional way of passing knowledge from elder down to adult, down to children, you know, that, that, that timeline um, kind of got um, disrupted. And now, we're in a position where elders, adults, and youth and babies are all learning from each other simultaneously. We're learning and re-remembering things all at the same time. And what a cool place to be in where, 
you know, you're, you're learning from children and you're learning from, from elders and everybody is sharing in that joy of reclamation. And it's not only bound to your age group because I, I, for one, especially during COVID, I am tired. I was especially getting tired of only hanging out with, you know, people in my own age group and being away from my community. I'm like, I miss elders and I miss babies. You know, there's this need to be surrounded by every age demographic and, um, thankfully things have opened up a little bit more now to help with that knowledge transfer, but totally. James, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your process when you are creating new music and mm -hmm. where that impulse comes from, how you work with uh, traditional sounds and maybe um, traditional styles to create um, the, the new music that you are, you know, using in your own forms. Sure. You know, I, uh, like like I said earlier, I think that uh, creativity is when you take two things that go, don't go together and you 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 put them together. And uh, um, you know, for this for this uh, this audio book, this podcast that I wrote, um, it's called Midnight Sun. Um, it's a true crime situation happened in the Arctic up north, and I, I wanted to capture the the feel of it but i wanted it to feel new and old at the same time uh and so i uh i got you know i, I found some rap beats from like you know like trap trap music byron knows you know <laughs> uh you know migos trap beats and stuff slowed down uh, you know and i <clears throat> i i made the beat i put i used the uh the rim of the drum where we start the songs i used that as the hi-hat and I use my foot stomps as the kick drum. And I use the hitting of the drum for the snare drum. And, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to make uh, a shaker, but I didn't know how. So I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make one. Like my mother's a uh, skin sewer. And so we have, you know, at her house, she has hides, polar bear, grizzly bear, you know, wolverine, wolf, all she, you know, she sews parkies. And so she, they have lots of claws. And so I made a shaker with 20 claws, with 20 different kinds of claws, because every animal, even us, we have 20, five, 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 and five. And so I put 20 claws and I used that as a little sound just because I wanted to see what it sounded like. I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, just because I think our, our people are highly uh, innovative and highly, um, you use a lot of ingenuity. We take what we, what's available and we make it work for what we need and uh, we're highly adaptable and because you had to be in you know the environment and uh you know it's it's one of those things where it's um you know it's it's just taking 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 the old and creating i think that uh, our, our ancestors would you know they would want us to learn all the old songs as much as you can, but they would also want you to write. They would also want you to try to add to the canon. And if it's good Traditional enough, songs were new at some point, they had exactly. to come from somewhere. <laughs> they were new at one point and they were the hot new single and everybody it, it made the dance floor go nuts, you know, chart toppers, you know, chart toppers. Yeah. And at, at one point they were new and exciting and fresh, you know, and that, that's what I hear when I hear Byron's music, you know, I, I get the same feeling where it's like, they want us to learn the old ways, but they, I think they would want us to keep it going, you know, and, and, and using what we have with what we got, you know, take what, take what's left, what's left, what did they leave us? Okay. That's what we want back. Now we're going to make it and go forward. So that's, that's the way I see it, you know. Absolutely. I love the way you describe your work as, um, you know, experimental, that you kind of creating your studio like a lab and like what yeah. would happen if I created this? What would happen if I, you know, put claws in a shaker? What would happen? And it almost reminds me of like uh, cooking show challenges, you know, that like you only yeah. have this basket of ingredients and, and exactly. what, can you, what can you create? What masterpiece can you yes. create with these 10 ingredients that's new and innovative? That's exactly still, it. still rooted in, in, uh, in a specific place and it's so fun to see what what people cook up with 
Byron, can you talk a little bit about uh, the nice segue from, from James? Um, you are incredibly proficient and gifted um, and have put lots of hard work into your traditional language. And I think that one of the, the most amazing things about the music that you're creating is that it does have, you know, this very modern, this very, you know, hip, cool, you know, feel, but you're so rooted and grounded in, um, in traditional language and um, are an incredible role model for many other uh, young Inuit in Alaska to, you know, oh man, Byron's doing this cool thing with this language. I want to, you know, be more fluent. Can you talk a little bit about why you started to do this work um, and, and why it was important for you to not only create your, your music that you do in English, but to also really push yourself to create music in your own language? Thank you for that um, first. And secondly, um, I think it was just a few years ago or a couple of years ago, I read a study done by UAF, uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks, and uh, they predicted that a lot of the Alaska native languages would be lost by the year 2100. Now it's 2021, that's about 79 years away, which could be just a lifetime. And um, even though um, my songs, uh, I try to create the songs in, in uh, Juch and a little bit modern, just so even after the language may be lost, you could always go back to the song. And a lot of the videos I, I post, I try to get the subtitles in just so you could get an understanding of what I'm talking about. And there's a few reasons to why I create a lot of my songs in uh, Juch Another one would be because we're in modern times technology is advancing so quickly and how could we keep the youth of today engaged to listening to traditional and modern um when you when i'm going well when i was in school even today um you walk the halls um you hear mainstream songs playing from people's phones or headphones and that's what they're listening to today um my goal was to try to create something like that, but in Yuchtun, something that they could listen to that is in their own language, but also still a little bit mainstream. And a lot of that um, comes, a lot of the inspiration that I get comes from um, Bumyo. Uh, my uncle is part of the Bumyo. And I remember when I was listening to on my cousin's old iP iPod, I listened to the album front and front to back. And when they started releasing newer songs with modern um, equipment, like what Jameis is doing, like with the drums, the snares, I realized that it's important to keep um, the traditions from how they've been. But another thing Jameis said was, um, we also have to adapt. And a question that, um, I asked myself when I started to transition was, would our ancestors do this if they had the same equipment? Would they be used, would they be creating new things if they had the same equipment that we have today? Uh, from the drums, the snares, the, uh, the guitars, um, the flute. Um, and I asked myself that and I was I started thinking, I think they would, I think they want us to keep um, the culture alive, the tradition alive, but I think they would also want us to adapt. Um, mm. Our people have always had to adapt. They would move with the seasons. Um, if it was winter, they would they would go more towards either inland or the ice, so where they could ice fish or go seal hunting and then if it's during summer, they would go more towards inland where the caribou or the reindeers are. So that was their way of adapting during those times. But since now um, in today's world, we have houses that we could stay in and we have snow machines and we have boats and we have four wheelers. Um, we, do, we don't have to adapt to another environment because we have those tools. Now, when you switch it over to music, they didn't have the tools to adapt back then, but now that we have the tools today, then I think we should take a chance to see what we could do with it. Um, 
and then it's also like I said it's also important to keep the, the culture alive absolutely I was working on a project recently um, that I called itqayuk and meaning tries to remember and um, I was given a book from uh, the Kitukmut Heritage Society that is um, part of the report from uh, the Arctic Exposition or Expedition um, with uh, Diamond Jeunesse and a whole bunch of other you know, anthropologists that was commissioned by Her Majesty the Queen <laughs> to go and study the Arctic, to go and study the plants, the animals, the people, the culture. And I was given this very beautiful old book that is a super old print and the binding is falling apart. Um, and in, in this book, um, are uh, the, the, the ethnomusicologists, people who were studying studying us because we're so fascinating, I don't blame them. Um, they were writing down and documenting these very, very old, specifically Inuit copper Inuit songs. And uh, a real gift that I uh, thought was so precious about it is that they also had somebody transcribe it into Western musical notation. And uh, as someone who reads a little bit of music, um, was able to, you know, hear these songs, almost play them out on the piano and have the lyrics really clearly documented for me. And for me, as a as an Inuk who lives in Vancouver, I don't there's you know, I don't have access to singers in the same way. I don't have access to my community in the same way. And you know, Northern internet is a challenge at the best of times. So trying to interface can also be a challenge to have this precious resource where I could be, um, you know, looking at the transcribed music and lyrics and also getting in touch with people at the National Archives in Ottawa who had um, wax cylinder recordings and they were able to send me digital versions of these wax cylinder recordings and the profound experience for me to be hearing my elders, my ancestors captured, their voices captured on, you know, on a record to be able to sing and, uh, you know, read what the lyrics were and try and copy and sing with them and visualize what they were doing. It was like having a duet with an ancestor. It was like having them in the room like I would if I was up north, have them over for tea and, and sing in the way that Julia is doing that work, um, you know, in her communities, and has even transitioned during the pandemic to doing it on Facebook Live, <laughs> and being able to, you know, oh, Julia just started a Facebook Live video, gonna gonna tune in and, and watch, um, and the 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 constant shifting and adapting that Inuit are doing um, to not keep practicing, but to keep thriving and to keep um, keep these ways of expression. Uh, alive and well, even in a pandemic. And uh, one more thing I just wanted to say about that was, you know, connected to, um, you know, breath and song and coming together as it was deemed dangerous by, by, um, by missionaries and, and different government bodies that us gathering and singing was something that was seen as dangerous, even though for different reasons. And to know, talk about a little bit about the isolation and of lockdown and that there was actual danger in us coming together um, to share space and share breath and song. Um, James, can you talk a little bit about how Inuit and how you might have um, you know, kept community ties over the pandemic about how you, how you innovated your, your collaboration process and um, uh, through, through the pandemic? Lots of Zoom meetings. Um, <laughs> a lot of Zoom meetings. Um, yeah, you know, it's just it was just one of those things. I, it, we uh, I look back on the history, Alaskan history, you know, and the world history. You know, the last great pandemic was in the 1917, 1918, 1919, and Spanish flu. Uh, and we see, I look back and we see how our people. Uh, adapted and overcame that pandemic you know and they did what they had to do and it's one of the values i believe is universally inuit is just the sense of it's we not me and the, the sense of we you know we look out for each other we take care of each other that was a inherently inuit thing inupat you know that's we it's it's more the 
the greater is you know it's the the, the greater is, is 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 better than just the singular um and so you know it was just a lot of a lot of phone calls a lot of a lot of zooms you know just just doing what you have to do to take care of each other in order to get through it uh you know and yeah it's been frustrating for sure uh but it's also been nice to you know spend so much time with you know my kids and my family and you know so yeah it, it's, it's been challenging but it's we're still still moving ahead it might be slow but at least it's still progress of course never straightforward but always onward <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um is there anything else that um uh, anybody would like to talk about in terms of the the blending of tradition and new forms of expression. Julia, have you seen in your drum dance groups and your, um, you know, singing communities um, at the beginning when you started to get when these uh, groups were new or when they weren't fully established as as singing groups? You know, what was the attitude like around making new songs as opposed to now? Has there been a change in how people think about their own ability to create new songs? I think I, I, I usually start off from what I know, begin with what I know and build on it. And what I didn't know at the time, I needed to build on what um, the terms, and like I was asked many times, have you created a new song? Have you created your own song? Traditionally, people who love to sing would create half their own song, create it in, you know, as young as they could. And I was asked a few times by elders if I created my own song. Have I have you created your own song? You're gifted, you're a gifted singer. You should create your own song. And I did not know how to create a song. I did not know the terms or understood a lot of the terms. And one of the ones that stuck out for me the most was um, Gumagot in the songs. Why did people write songs about Gumite? The, the worms that, you know, form with meat when they're out drying from flies. What significance did gumite worms have with Inuit? And I could think of medicinal or whatever, and all these things were going in my mind. Why I heard this term gumagot used in so many songs, and they're so significant. And I finally asked, and an elder laughed at me. And when I asked, what were Kumite used for in that it's used in songs? And she laughed and then she responded and said, it's a herd of caribou seen from a distance. They're moving, moving like so. Kumagot. Oh. Like, like the bugs that are formed around the meat, they're moving around the herd of caribou seen from a distance, very specific. So when they're using the term gumagua, they're talking about a herd of caribou. Nagyuligiyak is the bull caribou. Iblaulik is the female with the fetus. Nohalik with the calf. So again, very specific in our, you know, and as I strive to learn and understand terms to create songs. That's when I started to realize the relationship that people had with animals and how they value, how they place their beliefs and their values in terms of animals. They say animals, animals can feel when they're being talked about, much like what um, I think it was Byron that talked about the, the spirit of the animal. Um, won't come to you if you talk about them. It's much like the way I explain it in songs when we're singing. 
when you walk into a room and someone just talk badly about you, you can <laughs> feel that energy. You could feel that awful energy. And it's the same way if animals feel that energy that they're being talked about through their name, we don't say tuktu in the song traditionally. And when traditional songs were formed, they gave them a characteristic term that looked like something, and that's more specific to them. So as they're not gossiping about the animals, because that's what they thrive, they live from. That's what they, their clothing, their tools, their oils, everything comes from that. Their heat comes from the animals. And in order to have that connection, they had to show respect. Their values, their beliefs are so entwined. So learning to create songs was much deeper for me to understand before I could. I've started to write a song I've uh, written probably two storylines, two paragraphs so far. I have yet to go back to it. And I'm, I'm creating terms the way I think terms were created. When you look at the energy, when you feel the energy of something, how you create a term for that. When you respect and place values and beliefs that you're a part of something, that you need to ex be experimental with your language, be innovative with your language, be adapted, mm. be evolutionary like James said. We have to evolve. Our language was always evolving. Times didn't change, our cycles didn't change, our seasons didn't change. It's how we did things, being resourceful with the things around us and putting language to that. Amazing, Kwana. I've often wondered in some of my own research about the type of language used to describe everyday things and the um, in, in looking at some of these transcribed songs that you know, I always was curious of like, oh, why, why did they say it that way? Why is this singer saying the one that's used for kami or the one that's used mm. for oil, you know, and I've mm. always wondered about the, the cryptic nature in song. And thank you so much for sharing that. It makes perfect sense to me now that, you know, you're not wanting to spook the animal. You're not wanting to, um, you know, Uh, disrespect them in a way by being too specific and I've heard other um, elders from different regions talk too about the the heightened language in some songs so that you're not having um, conversations about something that's too adult in front of children but if you need to be sorting out an argument or talking about something important that's too mature for young children that there's also ways of singing it through song um, mm -hmm. in a way that's not, um, you know, traumatizing or in a way that's not, you know, asking too much of a child to be present if you don't have the opportunity to, uh, to talk mm -hmm. bluntly or, or like frankly about something. And I've always thought that was such a cool way to, um, you know, still be open to communicating about something that's difficult, but not isolating anybody else from, from uh, that conversation. For any people in the audience, Inuit or not, can we talk a little bit about what respectful dialogue looks like? How do we respectfully engage knowledge keepers in our communities? How do we approach elders? Um, can we talk a little bit about that protocol from an Inuit perspective um, to make sure that you're making your intentions clear about the conversation and the dialogue? Um, and I'll just open it up to, to anybody to talk about how do we meaningfully engage and respectfully engage with knowledge keepers? One of the things I, uh, I, I try and get to know the elders um, based on what their 
if they're singers, if they're storytellers, because not everybody's a singer, not every elder is a singer, not every elder is a storyteller or a song composer. And once I started to understand why songs are repeated and repeated and repeated, same songs, and I started to know, realize through old recordings, there's so many other songs that never got passed on and that we, um, we need to understand more about why our people are shut down, why our elders are not singing these songs and when is it safe and how is it safe? How can we make it safe for them to be able to talk? And what like our goals um, for language, for empowering our people, for supporting our learners. We got to talk about all these things so that our elders know the direction we're going in to keep our language alive, to keep our culture alive. We can't just talk about the physical part, the, the mental part, the emotional part. And we got to talk about the spiritual part, the spirit, uh, physical, traditional, spiritual part of who we are. We can't just talk about health and the whole being safely without the traditional spiritual part. We got to find ways to understand, find the elders who are ready to talk and who are ready to share and keep it safe that it's not going anywhere. It's not going public until they say so. Build that trust with our, with our elders. We're going to continue to engage our elders. Yeah, so true. Um, James or Byron, do you have anything to add about um, what people should be keeping in mind um, if they're think Inuit or non-Inuit, if they're thinking of approaching um, elders or knowledge keepers um, and how to do that meaningfully and respectfully from a, especially from an Alaskan um, perspective? In, in my experience, uh, you know, talking to elders and you know, just sitting and ch chatting with them and trying to get, you know, figure. You know, it's, I think it's important to just be very sensitive about what and how you uh, approach the subject, even though even to you, maybe you don't carry any guilt or shame or resentment about it. You know, I, I think a lot of our elders who survived residential schools, uh, you know, they associate their culture with, you know, with something dirty or stinky or, you know, because they were told they, you know, this is who you are is wrong. And, you know, like Julia said, just feeling them out and making sure that what, how you're doing it is in a very respectful, good way. Um, because you don't know, you, you, you just asking them, you know, innocently, it might, you know, be like a full on trigger. Uh, so just slowly, uh, just broaching the subject with grace and tact. Um, and then you find out, or they find out, okay, it's just he's safe. He's safe. They're safe. We can talk about it. Then it opens up. But a lot of times I think our elders are guarded because they're protecting their spirit. They had to, since they were small and, you know, approaching it is, uh, I think has to be done very respectfully. Of course, Byron, anything to add on that? Like James said, um, the approach is very important. Um, in my experience, um, whether it's at the store or at the airport or at like a community gathering or at a friend's house, um, I've noticed that if an elder wants to say something or if they have something to say, you just got to be quiet and just listen. Um, when it comes to approaching elders, um, I usually try to say, Hwaka, hi, Jangajit, how are you doing? And um, if, if they, they want to say something or if they have anything to say or if they feel like they need to share something, they're going to do it. And 
eye eye contact is um, really important when you're listening or nodding, and it's you also have to be respectful with what they have to say because there are many who would like to you know speak a lot and there are many who would just like to get like one message or some something direct out and i've noticed that um just being there to listen um not asking any questions and you know being sincere and respectful they it could always be built off of what they said the first time if they got something they want to get off their chest or if they want to share something when when you speak of something you're visualizing it in your head and then i think that elders also do that and when you're able to visualize it when you don't interrupt them when you're being respectful they're going to have something after that after what they said first and it's just it's it's just going to spread out and i've noticed that a lot in elder talks and when it comes to more than one elder then that's that's a bonus cuz they're going to work off of each other and like just like everyone, um, everyone knows something you don't. And for them to be passing on the knowledge, uh, you know, or for them to be sharing, you know, that, that, that must mean that they respect you enough to tell you or they understand that you want to understand how life was like for them before today. And every time um, they're done talking, say thank you. Um, always say thank you that shows that you were listening and you're going to take what they said into heart so always say thank you mm, absolutely I think too it's also important to remember that when you are approaching um, elders or knowledge keepers um, to be very upfront about your intention and to um, you know let them know what your intention is in this conversation so that they're not disclosing anything really personal and they, you know, you go and you take that out of context or anything. And I always find that being very um, upfront about um, the conversation that you are having and to also, you know, give lots of time and space because, you know, you have your, your plan, but then also, you know, you have to be accommodating and um, understand that, uh, elders have a different timeline and will often have a, a different plan and that you need to be respectful um, of that as well and embracing the unknown of, of what information an elder might give to you at, at, in any given conversation. And um, I think that uh, Inuit by nature are incredibly welcoming, opening people um, and we have accommodated whalers and you know all kinds of people embraced different people and cultures into our communities we pull together and we're very open and welcoming for the most part and I think that that cultural value um, can be taken advantage of sometimes by people who want to appropriate things about our culture people who maybe don't have the best intentions with um, you know talking about us about our, our, our art or songs or dances and so I think it's a good opportunity for people who um, maybe are think that, you know, what we're doing is very, you know, exotic or, you know, fascinating in any way to really take a, a moment to, okay, what's my intention? Do, do I have a right to, as a non-Inuk, do I have the right to, you know, take take some throat singing or take some traditional music and, and use it in a way that isn't intended? And I think that um, it's a great, great opportunity to learn about Inuit artists, Inuit musicians, and to open up dialogue for collaboration and not to um, be a site of appropriation or when you're taking something um, that is outside of your own cultural context. Because that's also one of the, the other, the flip sides of technology, of being more global, of having things on the internet, um, that when you start to put things out into the world, you don't always have the control about how that's being used. Um, so I think as part of a larger decolonial conversation to be having in your groups is, um, you know, how can we be engaging? How can we support these artists? How can we collaborate with artists and not 
do the um, the cherry picking of like, oh, I like this from this culture, this from this culture, this from this culture, and how can I smash it together into something that's interesting? Um, but how can you continue to have meaningful, accountable relationships in the collaborations that you do start? I'm still making it open to uh, the audience. If anybody has any questions, I don't see any uh, in the chat. Um, if you do have questions, please don't be shy. Now is your time to ask. Uh, and uh, if not, I'm gonna keep asking my own questions. <laughs> I think that the four of us should just start a band. I think that this should be the beginning and we should just start a band. <laughs> we can practice through Zoom too. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll do through Zoom. You got the mic, Byron. You know, everybody can. I'll handle social media. We'll have Julie as our songwriter. You'll make beats, James. It'll be awesome. <laughs> um, does anybody have any um, big projects that they're working on now? Anything that they're uh, excited to share about? What's what's up? What are people working on, Byron? I think it was about last year. This is my second year with. Um, I'm still learning how to make a little bit more modern songs. And during this pandemic, it's been the perfect time to experiment. And um, with this new project, um, it's going to be very interesting because um, I've I create, I created songs in multiple different genres from rap to R&B to pop but the, everything is going to be in Yuchtun and it's going to be a full album. Um, I'm pretty excited for this project to come out. I've, I've had a lot of good um, reviews on some of the songs that I've released and I've been working pretty hard on it. Hopefully this could be one of the um, projects where um, there are others who are listening. Hopefully that project will be like what Bumyo's project was to me, just to sit back and listen and really take it in and kind of look at all the all of the possibilities. I'm pretty excited for this um, new project. Um, I'm going to be releasing by um, artist named Byron Nikolai. Um, but it's been, like I said, it's pretty new. Um, there's a lot more to be done and pretty excited to see where it's going to go. There Exciting. Go. Yeah. We will stay tuned and follow all of mm -hmm. your channels to see when that new album drops. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to a question here. Um, and I guess this will be for uh, James and, and Byron. Um, do you believe Alaska Native Studies is a separate field from Indigenous Studies? Um, feel free to answer or not. Um, I can't as a non-Alaskan, but, uh, you know, do you have any thoughts on, on the field of Alaska Native Studies as opposed to Indigenous Studies? To me, they're the same thing, aren't they? You know, I would uh, say so. You know, I, <laughs> uh, you know, um, now, do I think that uh, Alaska Native Studies should be taught in Alaskan public school? Yeah, I think they should. I think that, uh, you know, I think that would help with a lot of things, but, uh, you know, um, Alaska is almost like its own little country. So, you know, Alaska's peoples are super unique. There's, you know, uh, just all kind of crammed in here in this big land. And so, uh, I don't know, to me, they're one and the same. Mm, they they yeah. are. Um, I feel like one of the differences um, or the main differences would, aside from customs and religion, um, uh, dancing, I feel like just the language um, would probably be one of the main differences. And um, just like how <clears throat> um, in, in Indigenous um lifestyle and Alaskan native lifestyle, we both tend to live off the land and <clears throat> and what we get from the land we use as our resource. Um, I feel like the main differences would just be the land, um, the land that we live on. Um, we're, we're in Alaska, so it's pretty far up north and there are definitely a lot of indigenous um, groups within you know, this land, um, 
within Canada, Greenland, and in the United States. But I, I feel like it would be about the same, wouldn't you think so, James? I think so, yeah. Awesome, Kwana. Great question for people who are uh, have music out and available in the world. What platforms would you prefer people to download your music directly from your website or Spotify? And I'll, I'll chime in here as well. Um, personally, uh, I find that the best um, platform to support musicians is to go um, either directly through their own website or if they have a Bandcamp page to purchase their music off of Bandcamp because the largest portion of that revenue is going towards the artist. If you get something on Spotify um, that the artist isn't making um, the full value of their work and you have to get a million zillion plays on Spotify to even start to see a little bit of that revenue. So buying directly from them or going to their Bandcamp page is often the best way to, to support their music. And if financial barrier is uh, an issue for you, there are many other ways to support um, the musicians uh, in your circles through um, tagging them on social media posts to telling your friends and family about them. Um, there's many different ways you can support. So um, that's that's what I think. Uh, anybody else have anything to add about where the best place to get your music is? A lot of, um, I mean, just from my experience, um, the major streaming services, and I know that there are artists who still have like hard, hard copies like CDs and vinyl discs. And so I think just contacting them and um, seeing if they would have like a hard copy or even like vinyl disc, I feel like that would be the best bet. And for artists like me, um, I do release some of my songs on SoundCloud where it could also be um, downloaded or played for free. Um, I have some songs on my SoundCloud. Um, it's you could look up Byron Nikolai on SoundCloud, and you should be able to see some of the work that I've done. And I typically keep some of the songs on there before I release the the actual album. So there are many different ways to um, support your Indigenous or Native artists. Yeah, Spotify is not. It's it it's it's Spotify is handy, but you you're getting. You're getting, you know, a quarter of a penny for, you know, a hundred, you know, it, it's just, it's pennies. So, yeah, I agree with you. Going to the them personally is more beneficial to the artist. Totally. Yeah. Um, I have another question here. I see a lot of use of throat singing in classical music composed by non-Inuit, non-Inuk. Um, in your views, are there ways to approach these collaborations which center Inuit voices over that of the composer? Thank you, Melody. That's a really great question. Um, you know, as someone who dabbles in the composition world, as someone who has worked um, with, with orchestras, as someone who has, you know, kind of been dipping my toe in a couple of different genres like this, um, you know, I think that the world has or the music industry has grown a lot in terms of stepping away from using um, throat singing or cultural elements as sort of um, fringe decoration on top of something to give it an extra umph, an extra bit of interest and has now the shift in conversation um, in the music industry is a lot more conducive to conversations about what is extractive and what is generative and what is collaborative and what is um, supporting um, indigenous music sovereignty, what is supporting um, intrinsic collaboration that isn't treated as an afterthought. And, you know, that's an ongoing growth, that's an ongoing um, conversation and discussion because, you know, there not just in music, but in filmmaking, in, in literature, in music, there have been really, really bad examples over, you know, over a hundred years of non-Inuit um, artists extracting Inuit stories and experience, like in Nanook of the North, like in, you know, all of these, um, you know, kind of pioneer moments in film and music 
that we're not, you know, based in Inuit being autonomous over their own voices and stories. And um, those are some very uncomfortable conversations that, that we need to be having about how do we center um, Inuit voice and expression in these largely and traditionally white spaces um, and how can we be you know making some elbow room for us in these spaces if that's how we want to be expressing ourselves and collaborating um, does anybody else have any thoughts or reflections on on that on on uh, Inuit representation in these genres that are starting to blend and, and meld um, the traditional and um, the contemporary yeah, I'll chime in here. Uh, one of one of the reasons I, uh, you know, I did the uh, on this soundtrack that I made for for Midnight Sun, I added the uh, throat singing. And now in Alaska, it's not prevalent, but in every other Inuit part of the world, it's there. And I think the missionaries here were just really, really freaked out by it, and they just were like, "Not get it out of there." But in my project, I said, I want to bring it back. I want to use it because mm -hmm. it's it's part of the greater whole of the greater Inuit, Inuit experiences. You know, it's part of us. It's one of the ways that make us unique to humanity. And one of the things that we contribute to humanity that's unique. And so uh, adding it to my, you know, uh, project was almost like a form of like rebellion or like punk or like rock and roll. I mean, it's yeah, like, yeah. I mean, that spirit of like punk and rock and roll. And, you know, that is part of that is needed for our music, for Inuit. You know, when when the missionaries banned our drums, you know, I remember seeing black and white clips of, you know, people just hitting anything, a can, a box, and they're going to make it. They're going to make a sound. You know, you can't keep us down. And so that to me that's uh so it's such an important part is to have that just a little bit of rebellious you know like no you we're gonna say what you know so uh that's how i feel about that quite awesome um have uh, a, another couple of questions here um are there any topics that are considered absolute taboo among arctic indigenous people and should never be asked about especially by anyone non-indigenous mm. that's a tricky one mm. that's a tricky question does anybody have any thoughts are there things that are absolutely off the table um to not talk about i don't think there's uh you could be, I don't think there's anything you cannot ask. It's just how you yes. ask and when you ask, mm -hmm. how do you ask? And like the sensitive subjects make it safe, be sensitive to your question and your what you're going to ask about, I think. I'm, I don't think there's such a thing where you can't talk about these things. You can't ask about these things. It's how you ask. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's so wise. That's so true. And um, I also just bring it back to intention. What is your intention in asking this question? Mm -hmm. And what's your intention with the answer that you may or may not get? And to be, be aware that if, especially if you're non-Indigenous, to be open to a little gentle scolding as well. That, you know, if you're, okay. if you're asking somebody um, questions that if you're already feeling are a little bit sensitive, um, you're going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes when we're in dialogue and relationship. And um, through that mistake, be willing to be held accountable be willing to apologize and be willing to repair something if you do make a mistake and and then get on with it that's how that's how Inuit roll I think for the most part <laughs> make One a mistake say sorry move on <laughs> yeah for back to that question about the taboos um within the Yupik culture try to avoid talking about the little people they're listening <laughs> oh 
<laughs> so I've had conversations where um, I've had older adults that we were, I was in a class and the teacher overheard us, Shh, don't talk about him. Especially when you're a hundred, when you go out there, they'll remember you. <laughs> but I think mm. that's more on the taboo side, but that's just, I just wanted to bring that up because I've heard that multiple times. Don't talk about the little people they are listening. <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> true i forgot about that thank you byron i remember being in elementary i told my teacher that i was gonna go catch birds um when you're talking about hunting you never want to say that you're gonna catch what you're gonna hunt for um mm. you could say that you're gonna try you're, you're gonna try to get it or you're going hunting for those but try to avoid saying that you're gonna catch um you know birds or seals or reindeer anything that you're going hunting for you're going for a walk with a gun yep i'm going for a walk with my gun if i come back with something then i had a good day <laughs> <laughs> and if not it was a nice walk <laughs> uh, we have uh another uh one more question um does it feel different using modern music tools in your indigenous voice songs compared to using animal made drums? So, you know, is there a different feel and tone when you're using traditional instruments as opposed to sort of modern interpretations or, you know, creating beats or using other, um, you know, non-traditional accompaniment or, you know, is there, is there a is there a through line in feeling or is there something totally different about um, about that process? Anybody can can jump in on there. I'll um, speak um, on a caribou skin drum versus synthetic material drum and the differences I've had. Um, the resonance that drum creates when it's in the right temperature for a skin drum. It has to do with the temperature, the humidity, um, how well you care for your, your drum, the skin, and versus the, the um, synthetic drum, the material drum. Um, it's made for indoors and it doesn't uh, get affected by the temperature or as the, the skin drum gets affected by the humidity in the room and the, or the dryness in the room. If they're too dry, then it affects the sound of uh, what you want to create when you're, the energy you bring out in the drum is what you're doing when you're beating your drum. So, you know, it's all about your tools and knowing your environment. My experience with uh, natural heads and uh, synthetic heads is in, if Inupak drum is made like Point Hope style Inupak drum with the made bent driftwood and maybe an ivory handle or an antler handle and it's got either a, a whale liver membrane or a walrus, mm. the sound, like, like Julia said, the sound is affected by the temperature and the humidity. But to me, the tone of the natural skin drum is warmer, is much warmer and, and, and natural, you know, just more closer to what it's supposed to be than the synthetic is, is, is convenient. But to me, it sounds brittle and plasticky. Mm. Yeah. It's, the, it's at the high end of it, it's shrill. Sounds like a slap, more of a yeah. instead of a. Boom. Yeah, the the traditional, you know, caribou hide or you know walrus hide, walrus liver, whale membrane. You know, they're warmer, but they are more. You have to, you have to uh, take care of them different. You gotta, you know, wet them different. You gotta just, they're just more finicky, but they are they have more base, and they are they are the 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 authentic representation of the drum and when you have more than one it. it's a magical sound just like, point hope, just like point hope when they're drumming yeah. i love the sound of their drums and when they're singing and they got the girls singing in the back too yeah <laughs> favorite dance groups all time it's powerful mm -hmm. it, it's not only the drum 
but it it's also the katu uh-huh. the kasalo the katu uh, uh-huh. the katu also has to have yeah yeah how well it's made how flexible it is the the different styles of katu the drum beater um how well they're made to beat the drum if they're stiff if they're hot they create a hollow sound or if they're cushion the shorter katu that us copper inuit use um i'm also i'm also um inupiaq uh, my grandmother is from nome alaska my dad's oh. mom so i carry on with some of the inupiaq songs and dances so i know the difference between having a good katu and a good drum they mm-hmm. both work together so fascinating we should have a follow up two hour conversation just about drums <laughs> i mean we all hit hit it from different you know from <laughs> you pick it this way and you back it from this way the canadians hit the you know the the rims you know greenlandic greenlandic you know hit this way uh, uh-huh. it's, all, it's all it's all different so yeah and but it's all good for a party <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> In uh, in closing, I'd love to hear um, James and Julia. Just any other projects that you're working on right now that we can keep an eye out and and follow you on the different work that you're doing. James, what are you up to? I uh, I am in contract to do another project for Audible. I'm making another audio book. I can't say what it's about. Uh, and I am also in the works of getting my my first project, Midnight Sun. Uh, I'm officially announcing uh, that we are putting together some trailers and we are pitching it to different popular streaming services. But that's all still uh, in the in the in the you know still being worked on right now. So I can't really like Byron said. You you don't say you're going to catch it. You I'm I'm going for a walk. <laughs> I'm going for a walk right now. If I come back with a, with a Netflix show, then I come back with a Netflix show. But, you know, so, uh, <laughs> you know, keep an eye out. You know, that's all I'll say. I love that. I love that. <laughs> and Julia, are you working on anything right now? I'm, uh, I'm working on um, uh, drama. I'm just rewriting uh, one of the stories for characters from one of the songs. So I'm working on um, with our dancers to um, dramatize one of their favorite songs. Plus also uh, hopefully end up with a children's picture, story, song book with um, just the way this songs are written with uh, an artist, a local artist, cartooning, like cartoonized story, picture of uh, illustrations of uh, the the story so that children can visualize. That's so important to me for the visual, what's happening in the story. Amazing. That's That's where I'm at right now. Awesome. Can't wait to see that. Um, uh, so, so happy to be speaking with, with all of you. You're all my heroes in different ways and in different uh, mediums. And um, I really look up to each of you. And I've had the pleasure of working with some of you. And um, I just send all the best wishes in all of your future projects. And thank you for, for ha- having this conversation um, and, uh, it's been incredible learning experience for me to just like soak it all in and, and listen to you all and really appreciate you, you giving this time over to us. I'm going to pass it back to Allison for our final goodbyes. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And, and thank you speakers, James, Julia, Byron, and Tiffany for moderating. That was such an incredible conversation and I think it goes without saying that a lot of us here listening in learned so much and it was such a rich beautiful conversation and we were so lucky to have you all come together to have this conversation today so I'm 
very, very grateful for all of you. And uh, thank you for everyone for tuning in. You can check out the event website to learn more about the speakers. So look it up. And I just want to say thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. thank you all. Bye. 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 Bye.